under the site uh, reconnaissance portion, um, we have to list the current under the current requirements. The owner, <coughs> pardon me, has to ensure access to all the occupant spaces. So if it's a multi-tenanted building, they have to notify the tenants and allow us access. Um, and a lot of times in the past, you you know tenants would say no. You know, or the owner, you know, may not want to do it, so you just say, oh, you don't have access, but now we have to get into those spaces so that we can properly do the phase one and ensure that we've, we've investigated all areas. We have to look at uh, all the properties in the study area. So that means in that 250 meter radius, we have to physically go around and look at all of them. So downtown Toronto, where you've got lots of buildings tightly packed in, it can take quite a while just to go basically a quarter kilometer in all directions. Um, and that all significantly increases the cost to do the work. Um, because, you know, we have to go look at all the commercial buildings. Do they have a dry cleaner in there? There's gas stations. You know, you may have old, you know, buildings that have been demolished that were industrial operations. We do have to look at that, you know, and take that into consideration, historical use. And we find that that's sort of one area that hangs people up is, they look at the current use of the property and say, oh, it's just a, it's a warehouse or it's a commercial office space. And there's no concerns. But as soon as you start digging back into history, you find out, oh, well, there used to be a, a bulk fueling facility or there was an old industrial plant on that property back in the early 1900s up to about 1950. And then they came through, demolished that facility and, and built this new building in, in the 60s. And nobody's ever really looked at any potential environmental uh, impacts or, or contamination on the property. So yeah, that, that's the one area that we find hangs people up the most, is they look at the current use, but don't consider the historical. And we do have to take photographs now. It's actually spelled out. Under the site reconnaissance, again, still more specific observations at the subject property itself, which is now defined as the phase one property. Current requirements, you know, we have to meet all those. And the site visit is to occur after the preliminary records review. And that's one area that can delay things if it takes a while to get documents in. We used to be able to go out and visit the site, you know, before we had a lot of historical information on it. Now we have to wait. Um, if it's an enhanced investigation property, there's increased documentation requirements that we have to get. We have to get dates for when things happened on the property, volumes of, of chemicals used, uh, sources, discharge points. So in other words, are they using something here and discharging it to a tank over here? Does it discharge the sanitary sewer after undergoing treatment? Um, various things like that. So in this particular Photograph here, this was a uh, light industrial property in a suburban area. And as you can tell they were uh, not too diligent in getting rid of their drums of spent uh, materials. Within the phase one study area, we have to identify and locate all potentially contaminating activities, water bodies and areas of natural significance. And with this is where the QP has some pretty heavy involvement, which is deter making a determination of the potential for these contaminating activities in the area to have possibly impacted the phase one property itself that, that you know, is the prime focus of this. So there, you know, it boils down to there is a little bit of interpretation and uh, experience involved. Review and evaluation of information, this is a, you know, it's a key component of every phase one. Uh, you know, basically it's pulling all the information we've gathered together, reviewing it, and making a determination on is there potential for contamination to be present on the phase one property, either from on-site activities or off-site activities, and do we need to do a phase two ESA, you know, as well as, you know, What's the degree of uncertainty? You know, was it something that somebody told you that was walking by the site and said they've lived in the area for 30 years and they remember seeing guys dumping stuff out the back door way back? 
or was it something that you know you've actually pulled from a documentate documentation like the MOE visited and actually you know gave them a citation or a notice for a illegal discharge so here's what we have to do under 511 you know we have to tabulate all the areas of potential concern environmental concern past contaminating activity uses conceptual site model logic and reasoning used to come up with conclusions we did um, you know, we can't just say do a phase two because we uh, say you should. We actually have to have justification for it and then dot any uncertainty. This here is, uh, shows the phase one ESA report format under the CSA standard. Um, as you can see, it's, it's somewhat comprehensive, but um, you know, it's not as comprehensive as the MOE standard. There was a lot of, you know, you had to look at a lot of things, but you didn't necessarily have to look at them in the same detail that you do now. Um, this here is one page of several in the new regulation on all the uh, requirements that the MOE has that have to be looked at and investigated under the, uh, what we call, like Albert mentioned, that people call Reg 511, but should really be referred to as 153 as amended. There's a seven page table that lists the mandatory minimum requirements. Uh, you must have QP involvement. So if you're getting a phase one under the new standard that is not, uh, does not involve a professional engineer, a professional geoscientist, that is listed as a QP on, on the MOE website. It's not just, you know, Somebody could be a professional engineer, but they actually have to be designated as a QP by the MOE, so they have to file some paperwork that Albert mentioned earlier. And we have to have conclusions. Um, whether or not we feel the record of site condition should be issued on the phase one as it stands by itself as a standalone document, or whether a phase two is required before record of site condition is issued. So in general, there's more detail required, which more time on site. All this leads up to more time generating a report, more time digging for information, reviewing information, and translates into a higher cost. Uh, you're likely going to have more properties subject to a phase two ESA simply due to all the potentially contaminating activities that are now clearly defined under the amended regulation. And the phase one ESA time frame has gone from, you know, a typical of two to three weeks to complete with the disclaimer regarding documents may not have been obtained from certain government sources to, you know, now it could be um, several weeks to months before it's completed. Best case scenario, you're probably looking at five weeks um, because we do have to wait for the MOE respond through the Freedom of Information Act request we have to do. And with that, we have to do FOI requests on all adjacent properties as well as the Phase 1 property itself. Um, horror story, so to speak, right now we have a site. Um, we're doing everything to the new standard. We submitted our FOI requests. We knew one of the neighboring properties was an old abandoned gas station. We knew that it had leaked. Um, but in order to complete the phase one, we have to get all that documentation on that property from the MOE. Uh, we started the process in March, and we are still waiting to get the documents from the MOE. So uh, part of the problem there was there was third-party involvement that had to give the MOE authorization to release some of the documents. So after waiting 120 days, to receive the documents, we got notice of this third-party involvement, and we were told it was going to be another 30 to 60 days before we would hear from the MOE. I think it was 30 days for the third party to respond, and if they hadn't responded within 30 days, then they would go ahead and start, start the process of copying the documents and getting them to us. So yeah, we were working out there when there was snow on the ground, and I'm not sure we're going to be done before there's snow back on the ground. And so that, you know, obviously increases your transaction time. 
know, a lot of times we get called in, hey, we're in the due diligence phase, environmental's due up next. Can you do a phase one for us and how quickly can you turn it around? A lot of people want it within, you know, some of some as short as one week. You know, we, we've got a week to get this done. What can you do for us? If we have if you're going for a record of site condition or you want a record of site condition, one week's completely out of the question now. You're looking at, you know, like I said, five weeks, probably six to seven weeks would be the norm. Uh, phase two ESAs are even worse, uh, especially if we go to remediation. Um, with the remediation component, uh, there's requirements for post-remediation monitoring of the site. If you do simple excavation, dig and, dig and dump, uh, you have to wait three months, 90 days post remediation. So once you're done, you have your confirmation samples in. You have to wait 90 days, then check groundwater again, reinvestigate the site basically to make sure that there's no rebound effect or that you haven't missed something. And then you have to do one more monitoring event three months down the line from that, or actually two monitoring events. So you could be several months in remediation on dig and dump if you do in situ remediation, if you have a groundwater problem, you're doing injections to remediate the groundwater problem. Uh, from the time you're done your in situ remediation, again, you have to wait about three months, 90 days, to do your first round of groundwater monitoring. And then you have to have four consecutive quarters. So you're looking at a year plus from the time you're done remediation. So you've got the lag time from when you did your phase two and delineated the contaminants on the site to, you know, you developed your remedial action plan, you've now executed your plan, everything's gone well, you've cleaned up the site, you've met the, uh, the applicable standards for that site, and now you have to do all this post-remediation monitoring. So under this, you know, it could take a while before you actually get your record of site condition. So, um, touching on the phase two aspects of this more, um, as, as Albert alluded to, there are new standards, there's new tables. Um, the standards have, have changed for a lot of the different compounds and parameters that we look at. Some have increased, some have decreased in terms of their allowable concentration, some have stayed the same. Um, so with that, you know, it, it's, it's, it's put us into a new regime of, of what we have to do. And, and in some cases, it's, it's made cleanup a little more unattainable on some properties. And thus, where I mentioned risk assessment earlier, people are, are going to the risk assessment approach rather than the traditional remediation. And with the risk assessment, in a nutshell, it's... Um, more or less developing site-specific uh, concentrations for, for the parameters involved for that property. So we collect some background information, run some calculations, and, and see you know, whether or not we can increase the allowable concentrations. That all has to be you know, approved and accepted by the Ministry of the Environment. So, yes. <coughs> 